you very much, Maria. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to start by drawing the distinction between an estate plan and your succession plan. Because I find very often the words get intermingled, bandied about, um, one used as replacement for the other. But in truth and in fact, and I guess the lawyer in me would move the definition, right? So your estate plan covers your everything you owe, less the everything you everything you own, less everything you owe at the point that you pass away. So your, uh, planning for your estate involves planning how all of your assets will be handled when you die, but not just at the end of life. So it includes when you become inca incapacitated. And that's why starting your estate plan, you would, you would start with your will, yes, but you would look at whether a power of attorney is applicable. And then when a person loses mental faculties, the appointment of a committee. So estate planning holistically, is not just for the wealthy. I think people in their minds sort of say, oh, I don't need to do planning for my estate. I don't have a big estate. But once you own anything, anything that constitutes your estate, so your car, your home, your bank account, regardless of the quantum in it, that is your estate. Let's see, if you could show this slide that I have now, I, I did a sort of graphical depiction of what your estate plan looks like. So next slide. So your estate plan is your overall holistic planning for everything you own and how you're going to use those resources to enjoy the life you have and then also plan for both your retirement and succession. And that's why you will see those two as subsets of your holistic estate plan. So retirement planning would be when you start putting aside your resources for, to enjoy your retirement. But when you're doing your overall planning, you have to look at where you're going to put those resources, how much you're going to be saving, because you have to look at what lifestyle you're living now and therefore what lifestyle you want to live in retirement. And therefore, all of that forms part of your overall estate planning, retirement being a subsection of that. Succession is an even further su subset of that, because succession planning really applies to people who own their own businesses, right? So it wouldn't be to, to all and sundry. But once you own your own business, succession planning is critical because it involves creating a detailed strategy for how you're going to pass the leadership of your business on when either you retire or, or you die. But it's not to say that if you have a succession plan, then you don't need an estate plan because your estate plan deals with everything else that you own and owe that may not form part of, of your business. You may not have assets that are only in the business's name. And, and even if you do, you have your own personal affairs. So those things, and um, Doralan and I will speak more about it before, but I wanted to show this diagram so that you can sort of crystallize in your mind as we go through the rest of the discussion, the distinction or the difference between your estate plan and where your succession plan fits into that. So both are important to entrepreneurs. Um, from an estate planning perspective, so let's, we're gonna talk about that first. When you sit to discuss your estate plan with, with a specialist, and the specialist should be a qualified attorney as well as someone who has the financial and insurance aspect of um, assets under their belt, you have to itemize everything you own. And I mean, we covered the, the basics, right? Land and bank accounts and whatnot. But in these times, you also have to think about things like timeshares, iTunes account, your Amazon, Netflix accounts. All of these things are assets. And there's been some really interesting court cases as to how those assets left in wills can actually pass on and be distributed. So I won't bore you with all those details now, but there are some really interesting um, litigation going on around those things. So estate planning is you're really making sure that all of your investments and insurances match your needs and that they'll be sufficient to cover your expenses during your lifetime so that you can enjoy the life you want and still pass on a legacy. Where an estate plan again differs from your succession plan is that you can set out in your estate planning things like guardianship provisions for your minor. So in your will, you can in fact name and specify a guardian for any minor children that you may have. I mean, I'm not gonna go into all the family court aspects of it, but the, when you specify it in your will, it is deemed a wish upon your death. Family court does have ultimate jurisdiction, right? Estate planning also involves trust. So and let's take a pin there and talk a little bit about that. So the concept of a trust is not very well um, 
there's not very well much practice in Trinidad. It's deemed to be for the ultra wealthy, um, ultra high net worth, because it, it is an expensive way in which to actually set up a, a separate entity called a trust into which all of your assets are held and there stamp duty implications, why you would do it. And then you have to pay a trustee a quarterly or annual fee. So it is expensive. But there, but there are other um, trusts, something that that's also called, is referred to as a testamentary trust, which is when you don't have to hire a trustee or a trust company or a trust firm. But in your will, once you leave an asset to someone who is a minor at the point in time when you die, what is created is in fact a testamentary trust. So without having to pay RBC trust or FCB trust is to be a trustee. You have in fact actually created a trust because you've set up a will, you've named someone to be the executor and trustee of that will, which is a real person, um, not someone you're paying or your friend, your sister, whoever you name as that executor in your will, but you're leaving an asset that can only legally pass to a minor when they become either age of adulthood, which is 18 in Trinidad, or in your will, you might specify not until they turn 21, 25. So during the period of time when you when you pass and when they attain that age, a trust is actually created. So, so the trust concept does exist, um, but not in the way, the notional way that we know it from watching all these US TV shows and, and, and law shows. Um, that type of trust, testamentary trust, is also prevalent in Trinidad, given the example that I just raised. In, in estate planning as well, another tool or concept is that of the power of attorney, which is an instrument that you give whilst you are still of sound mind and body that gives someone that you nominate the power to act and sign, or execute things on your behalf. One would use that if it is like, let's say in retirement, you have children that live overseas, you know, you're going to be traveling a lot. Um, you want to give someone in Trinidad that power to conduct business on your, on your behalf. You might have tenants down here, so you need that person down here. So they're, they're very sound and valid reasons why one would give a power of attorney. Something that I think is not very well known is that once you lose your mental faculties, the power of attorney ceases to exist. So people... People think or believe, well, I do I do a power of attorney now because mommy is starting to get dementia. When she she goes down even more, at least I'll have the power of attorney so I can transact on her accounts. That is in fact not the case. Um, the power of attorney ceases to exist once you are no longer of sound mind and body. And then there's another process and another um, not a document, it's, it's something called appointment of a committee that steps in, and that, that is what you would need to do to be able to act on the person's behalf. Garlan, I don't know if you wanted to jump in here, because I know we were chatting a bit about the, the committee, appointment of the committee. So, Alia, thank you so much for uh, making a clear distinction between estate planning and succession planning. I found that to be very enlightening for me. So I'm going to ask a question and maybe Doral can jump in. What happens if a businessman has a will and thinks he's done all that's necessary but has no succession plan? Well, maybe Avia, he might think the will encompasses his succession plan. So for instance, he may think that he has put or his wishes are clearly documented in that document we call his last will and testament. But there are so many things surrounding wills which can hamper that last document. We could affect that last document that he has in fact signed. Now, we are Caribbean people and Caribbean people, for example, are known to, for instance, walk out of one marriage, enter into cohabitation relationships with uh, another loved person, and they die with that cohabitant. Now th there's a wife there who may be comfortable thinking, yes, even though, even though he has walked out, it may be that he hasn't changed his will. But cohabitants, can register as a cohabitant, is it 21 days or 28 days 
after the death. And as long as you do that registration with the probate registry, you are entitled to claim like a wife. So where the wife may be sitting comfortably, thinking that she is in possession of a particular will, alas, there is a cohabitant watching you in the face. And that cohabitant, if it is that the person was there at the time, could have a life interest in that house that they had um, with Mr. Joe Bloke. So yes, you may be comfortable in the fact or your knowledge that you have done what you think you ought to do in terms of doing your will, setting up yourself. But we start in the Caribbean new relationships which affect many of the documentation that we may have put before. Uh, that will affect us, yes? And, and there are others as well. Now, Avi, I would have shared with you there was a conversation I had with one Mr. Costa. Shall I share this with you? Yes. yes. It will be yes. very yes. useful yes. that you yes. share that uh, share that story, Doral. Yes. So yes, this we are in a Caribbean space as we sit here. But so forgive me. This is a Trinidad and Tobago story. So I had a conversation with one Mr. Costa, and Mr. Costa. He is from a generation of what we will call tailors. In fact, his parents started a toy store on Duke Street in the 1960s. I think it was 1960. Right, they then gravitated or moved to a high style garments where you may now know of Ecliff Eli. The Da Costas were like the Ecliff Eli. So, you know, they measure the tailor. You, don't, you just tell me where the tailor pass, and I'll give you a suit. The Costas were like that. So, the Da Costa started that, and Mr. Roger Da Costa, who is the gentleman I spoke to, he joined his parents in the 1970s. He then went on to um, get qualified at a college we call the John, John S. Donaldson Technical Institute, and he continued with his family business. He actually took it over, and by the 1980s, he was running it, you know, um, and all was well. He says that he recalls outfitting several prime ministers, bishops, archbishops, attorneys at law, AGs, really some prominent persons in our society. His watchwords were quality and service. They did everything. Everyone was, you want a good suit? Go buy the DaCostas on Duke Street. Sadly, Mr. DaCosta closed his doors in 2020. I asked him, why did this happen? He said, sadly, he had no successor from the 1960s, he's now in 2020, there is no successor. But we delved a little more into the reasons that um, he couldn't find even an employee to hold on to this business. And he gave me several bullet points. He said, many persons could go on the internet and they could purchase what they will call a suit. It may not be bespoke, but they are willing to settle for that internet, that, that suit which they purchased online. So they started to import their own clothing. He also indicated that his family were unable to compete with container imports. And let me explain that. The tailor of long ago would go to the cloth store and he may buy bowls and bowls of high-end material. Now, you, when you have persons bringing in containers for themselves to go into the clothing build business, he was unable to do that. He said also that person's style changed. You would know that if you have a dressmaker or a tailor, you would usually want to stick with them. And so, 
many of the old stages they would have died out their children may not they would have changed styles so they no longer wanted the Costa cut the da Costa styles he also indicated that the ethics of the workers had changed you know and he found himself spending an immense amount of time micromanaging and supervising the staff the older clients were no more the younger ones wanted a new look and last but not least and which was extremely significant mr da costa indicated that he had no infrastructure to deal with new banking and statutory regulations he had no infrastructure that is a major dilemma of an sme a small medium enterprise especially those that come from the cottage and grew from a cottage industry how do they compete in the world in the world where you just sign forms where there's fiu where there's aml where banking wants this and that and the other the question is to all of us this afternoon are we willing to lend a hand are we willing to help these smes are we willing to be there for them i leave that in your hands Thank you so much, Doral, for sharing that story about the DaCosta family and regrettably the closing of that business. I'm going to ask Alia to jump in and share her thoughts on what she just heard. Thank you, Doral, and I think that is an excellent case study that we can analyze and delve into more. And I one of the earlier sessions this afternoon where they spoke about having an independent board of directors or having at least some independent directors on your board, i.e. persons who are not related to you or not involved in the business. That's where you see the value of that, right? And I'm not talking about having a big fancy board of directors. Um, it's, it's a small team of people you can rely on, you can, you can trust to advise you as to whether you're going in the right or wrong direction. And as cliched as this may sound, having some people of the younger generation on that board because they would be able to bring you up to speed on what the trends, internet, online shopping, um, the, the, the frequency of which that's being done, and then the online purchasing, because obviously the cost of business, not saying it wasn't doing well as, as a business and it, it had its own clientele, but as they grew and they grew older, he was not keeping up with the needs because he was still trying to do everything. He was chief cook and bottle washer, and he didn't have that oversight and that experience that maybe a younger person would have brought to the table. So when you look at that, um, and, and they were saying in the earlier panel as well, you don't have to have a big, fancy, expensive board. One of them referenced having a, a nice lunch for the board of directors, and that was their payment. So it's not that you're paying exorbitant director's fees, but you're getting insight from people who are involved in similar or even different industries but but in business and can say to you you're direct you're going in the wrong direction and i think if we look at the da costa as a case study we can see what they could have done differently or better and i think th those those were some of the things so christy if you can show my next slide it actually goes right into that so when you have a family business these are some of the succession planning questions to consider is your business viable into the next generation? Let's look at the costas. Yes, I would still say it is because Eli Eclipse is doing fantastically well, which means that there's still a need for the bespoke tailored look. But Eli is all young and fancy and, and, and he, he, he caters to the younger generation because he has that age dynamic behind him. The costas didn't have it, right? So if you look at this question, the answer for the costa would be yes. So we have to look at what he should have done then to market it. How many family mem members did he have in the business and in what roles? I don't know if we got that information, but you know, it's not a yes or, or no, or right or wrong. If he didn't have family members, then you're bringing external people. One of the, some of the research I had done was showing that internationally, the trend now is that family businesses after the first generation isn't even passing to the second generation but primarily because the second generation isn't interested. There's so many other avenues that they want to explore, and they look at the family business more as they fall back. 
But in that case, then it's not going to be run properly by someone who sees it as a fallback, as a secondary option. So bringing in external people, whether external managers only with the shareholding remaining with the, with the A's, or giving the, the managers at least some equity stake in the business so that they put their heart and soul in, in it too. These are some of the solutions when you have a family business and you don't have family members involved in it to take it forward to transcend generations. And if there are no family members willing to join, these are the steps you have to look at. You have to look at someone that's external. The flip side of it, and I know this didn't feature into the cost of the case, but it's still important to consider. And you see a lot of family businesses in Trinidad. There are family members on the second generation who they start to work in the business, they do a little stint here and there, but are they qualified or is it that they grew up alongside mom and dad and therefore they, they assume that they can take over because mom and dad were able to do it without you know the, the letters behind their name. But remember now, they are now competing in a different market, in a different environment with, with external people who probably have more of the qualifications and the marketing. Uh, the the cost of case shows it with internet trends and all of those things. So you have family businesses where the second generation are involved, but they may not necessarily be qualified or equipped to take it to the next step or take it to the next level. But if the interest is there, so you know we have to marry interest um, with, with, with skill set. So if the interest is there, there's nothing stopping them. And I'm sure any of any of you who ever done an interview for someone in your company or your business, you don't hire for credentials and academia anymore. That, that's what gets them the interview. That's what gets them into the door. But once the um, the ability is there to learn and, and to take the business forward and you see that in, in your family, then, then it's about upskilling them, making sure they're appropriately trained, both with the academic qualifications as well as with the physical physical run of the mill in every area of the business. They can't expect to take over as the CEO of a business when they've only worked, let's say, in the finance or the accounting department, because that's what they studied in school. They have to do their stint in every area so that they understand the business inside out. And you have to put timelines and timeframes on that so that the business is not left in a gap when you transition out or, or God forbid something you know sinister happens to your health and you are not physically able to be there the, the rest of the team, the rest of your staff, they're going to look on what with you know questioning eyes, wondering, well, where is this business going? Who's really taking it over? Does the second generation even understand the business the way I understand it? Because I've been here for 30 years with, with the owner. Um, they've you know gone off to university. They only came back for a little summer stint here and there. So all of those things are things to be mindful of. And that's where you know, the founders of the firm, they sometimes, I've had clients where their, their grandfather left this documented letter of wishes, how he wants the firm to transition into the next generation, what his vision for the firm is. And then ultimately, all of that is to say, if there is no one in the family or with, with that last name, let's say, that wants to continue working in the business, then should the business be sold to provide liquidity for future financial um, or is it could be a foray into a completely new business line, a business line that the second generation is in fact interested in, because it may be that what the first business um, was involved in is something that's of a dying breed um, as things as things evolve, as the world evolves. So there are all of these questions that need to be considered by any any businessman that is looking to start their succession planning. Um, and ultimately, at the end of it, you, yes, you always work hard to provide for your children and your family, your, your legal or literal next of kin. So you have to consider how you marry or juxtapose what you've worked hard for, who you want to leave it to, and then the continuation or the management of your business thereafter, because those two circles may in fact not interact. Your, your wife and your, your spouse and your next of kin, your children, may have no interest in running running that, that type of business. They may be involved in something completely different, but yet you want to, in your will, leave your shares in your business to them. Where does that take you? Where does that take the business? Aliyah, I think those questions that you outlined, they were very thought-provoking, I must say. Traditionally, if, um, for me, how do you have, how do you have this, these conversations? They kind of tend, people tend, tend to think that when you talk about estate planning and succession planning, it's kind of morbid. I recall I would have had a discussion with my dad who is aged, you know, about ensuring that um, he appoints someone 
to ensure in event anything goes wrong, at least there's someone there that can take care of his estate and whatever he owns. Um, and it was quite a difficult conversation. It did not resonate very well um, with him. So how do we advance this discourse as it relates to SMEs and family-owned businesses, the importance of estate planning and succession planning? How, how, how do we, because clearly it's not something that um, in the Caribbean we talk a lot about. Uh, Avia, may I just um, add one thing? Oh, I don't one thing to, to Aaliyah, um, one of the things we didn't speak of, not yet, and I'm quite sure Leah is going to get there as well, is the question of intestacy. Now, that is a major area in the Caribbean. I once did an estate for an airline pilot, a large estate. And it's only on the death of this gentleman that persons found out that they were sisters and brothers. No. He had, you know, various children or pick me as we say in, <laughs> in different places. And there were some businesses as well. So the question is when you have siblings who are meeting for the first time after the demise of a parent with some significant wealth, how are you going to get to yes? in terms of moving ahead, especially when that parent may have had some businesses, shares may not have been allocated. It, it brings some interesting questions, eh? Aliyah? That, that is, um, I think, more, more realistic in the Caribbean than, than we probably even like to admit. And it is something, and again, this is why I think education around these things is so important. That that pilot, I mean, he had a, he had a good job. Why didn't he have a will? And and so I go back to education. And a lot of my, um, I guess, realization after years of practice is sometimes the employer does have a bit of a responsibility just in terms of education of their staff, right? So they always talk about the four quadrants of of um, compensation, salary being just one of them. But, you know, educating them, um, lunch and loans, those types of things. Th these are estate planning, financial planning, um, the importance of insurance, uh, and, and not just to be sold it by an insurance agent who's obviously selling it just to get the commission by selling, but having um, your, your employer sponsor these things so that they're bringing the, the relevant skill set to, let's say, a lunch and loan in the office <laughs> or half day of, of educating their staff, just to, to bring that on the table to them, then it starts triggering other thoughts because the facilitator can then show the consequences as Doralan pointed out. What happens in Trinidad if you die with a will versus without a will? If this pilot were to realize that, hang on, so you mean if I don't have a will, everything I own goes to 50% to the spouse and 50% to all of my children, whether they're children of that spouse or not, it would have triggered other thoughts in his mind that, okay, maybe I should do things to, to rectify this. But he's busy studying aeronautics and how to fly. No one taught him this in school. And so I go back to that as well. So I'm, yes, I said the, the employer, um, and that is for, for adults, but this is also something that should be started in school, um, secondary school, or at least university, where people are just made aware of these basic things. So basic financial literacy, um, things about bank accounts and credit cards and how to use them, but certainly, estate planning as well then, because it will then go hand in hand. So what happens when you die without a will? Just little tips like that, you, you don't realize sometimes how that would trigger in someone's mind a thought that they would never have gotten otherwise if they don't have that information. So I think that that is a, a really good example to show what happens, uh, not just in Trinidad, I think that's around the Caribbean. I, 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 I totally agree. Go ahead, I'm Doral. I'm sorry, Avia. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that sometimes we don't understand how far reaching the consequences may be. Because if it is that a wife gets 50% of that estate, and let's say the estate was a, a large house, and there's an insistence on selling this large house, 
then some children who were living there may find themselves homeless. Homeless. Because they may not have the means to get shelter on their own. Agreed. That's an, that's an interesting point you raised. I was going to circle back to ask a question for you to talk a little bit more about the cohabitant and the situation that can arise um, as it relates to a husband leaving a wife and cohabiting. And you, you mentioned that you, they, can reg make, they can register within 28 days and stake a claim to that estate. So there'll be families that will be disrupted and impacted negatively from. So if you can... Um, Share some more thoughts on that. I, I have not, I do not have the Cohabitation Act before me, and I'm not quite sure whether all the jurisdiction in the region would have it. But under our jurisdiction, um, it is a court matter so that that cohabitant will register with the probate registry that they are cohabitant, and then they will make the application for a share in the estate. Now, the entire estate is not going to go to them. And the court is going to do a fact finding. So in fact, even though I have done my registration, um, the Register General's office will send out someone, talk to neighbors, find out how long these people have been living together. And, and, and there is a number, they will find evidence of the cohabitation. So it's not just, I, I can't just make a spurious claim because it's going to be tested. But the fact remains that people may think that because I am the registered wife or I am the registered spouse, then someone else cannot make a claim. And so once the person can prove that they have spent X amount of years, is it five years or seven years in Trinidad, then once they can prove that, then um, they can have a claim to some stake of the estate. I want to jump in here because there was a recent, recent as in last year, case decided in Trinidad. We've just been talking about where the deceased dies without a will and with a wife and a cohabitant. This case, um, he had the wife and the cohabitant, but he actually had a will. And in his will, he left everything to the cohabitant and to the children of that union. And the wife challenged it. She challenged it in court and she was successful. So the cohabitant was basically given... The, the house that she and the deceased had shared and whatnot, but the judge in his, in his learning and his decision-making said that the deceased would not have gotten to where he was in his career. He was a doctor, a medical doctor, if he didn't have the wife to support him and support his, um, his family because he had children with her as well, and that she gave up her career to be a house, well, housewife or stay-at-home mom with, with their children, and that she was entitled to, I, I can't remember the percentage, but I do have it on my social media page. Um, I have the, the, the newspaper link for the actual report of the court case on there, because I thought it was so fascinating that the judge actually overruled the will of the deceased to basically say you can't ostracize your wife by just putting it in a will. That's quite Doral, you want to come back in? No, I was just thinking of another matter, but um, we will, I, I will just touch on it so we can come back to it later. Because sometimes persons may think they are divorced. And if they do not have a decree absolute in hand and the person dies, even though they went to court and had a divorce hearing, without the absolute, they have died as a married person. So we can always get back to that. Interesting. So I have a question. So, so if if you, what's the difference between having a will from a power of attorney or committee? I could jump in. So, a will is a testamentary document. So it basically only takes effect or kick in when you die. So you do this will up. You could change it twenty thousand times. You could change it up to the day before you die and then it takes effect. What the will does is it specifies how you wish to distribute your assets upon your death. So how I just referenced the, the pilot that died without a will, his assets were distributed in accordance with the Administration of Estates Act of Trinidad and Tobago, which says that 50% goes to the spouse and the rest goes to the children. But in, in your will, you can specify anybody or, or anything, any charity, any association that you want to leave your assets to. A 
power of attorney is more of a living document where it's, it's only valid during your lifetime. It, it, it dies when you die. But as I referenced earlier, it also dies when you become of unsound mind and body. And all it really does is it gives someone the authority to act and sign on your behalf when you are either not physically in the jurisdiction or not physically able to be there to do the signing. Whereas the committee is a, is a committee appointed under the Mental Health Act where when you are now of unsound mind and body, even though you had had a power of attorney, and even if you have a will, the will doesn't kick in because remember, you're still alive. So you then need this third instrument, which yes. is where your, your next of kin, your loved ones would go to the court by an attorney to make an application under the Mental Health Act to have one of them appointed as your committee, which would allow them to, to do the same things that a power of attorney would allow you to sign on or transact on the deceased accounts, or he may have property that is rented to tenants um, that requires legal signatures and whatnot, but he obviously can't give the signatures. That's what the committee does. So the committee is akin to the power of attorney, but for the reasons that I said before, you would need the two, um, depending on your, your mental capacity. Thank you so much for answering. That provided clarity for me, and I'm sure if anyone else had a doubt in their mind, I'm sure that explanation has made it crystal clear the difference between the will, power of attorney, and having a committee. So I know, Doral, you said you wanted to come back in to share a little bit more on estate planning and succession planning. Would you like to jump in now? I think that was Aaliyah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't mind jumping in because I, I did want to, I wanted to make the, the, the point then coming back to the businessman, right? Because this is about the distinction between estate and succession planning. So the businessman has different options and, and these are things i've seen in practice so i referenced one before where he leaves all of his shares in the business in his will um, so that is an option you have but don't do that in a vacuum do that after you've had discussions with your family members to see if in fact they want to inherit the business i'm not saying they don't want to inherit the value of the business right everybody wants what mommy and daddy work for that they're leaving for them they want to inherit the value but do they understand the power that comes along or the responsibility that comes along with inheriting those shares? It's like Spider-Man Ford, with great power comes great responsibility. So you inherit the shares. Does that mean you can now buy a Porsche? No, unless you're cashing the shares. But if the shares are not in a public listed company and most businessmen in Trinidad, their, their, their family business is not a public listed one, you can't just cash in your shares in mommy's bakery company or, or, or daddy's um, or oil drilling company or, or whatnot. Those are illiquid shares. They're not traded on a stock exchange where you could go to Wise or Boss and just sell it. So you've inherited shares. What does that mean? That means you have the responsibility that comes with it, which is to run the business, to make sure money comes in every month, to pay the employees, to pay the suppliers, to pay the contractors, and that the business continues to run. If you have no interest in that line of business, or you have your own business and company, or you're, you're still in school, or one of the panelists um, this afternoon was referring to, well, they left it to their favorite grandson, but he was only interested in playing cello or playing the accordion. So, so you have to make sure there's cohesion between your estate plan and who you love and want to leave your shares or your business to, and your succession plan, which is what is going to happen to your business, how is it going to run, and who is going to be the person to run it. And those two things don't, always align. The person that is best at running that business may not be your favorite grandson or, or your spouse or your children. It may be the person that has been working in that business with you and understands it. So, so leaving, leaving it in your will is, is one avenue the businessman can pursue, but he needs to understand the consequences. And to do that, he needs to a, consult a estate planning, succession planning specialist like Doralana Dora and myself, and he also needs to speak to his family to understand where their heart and their interest is. The second thing that they, that they can do, and this is one that pains me because I've seen it so many times, is they try to transfer the shares to, to their children. And the children are probably working in the business, so that's fine. But they try to do it during their lifetime by simple um, shortcut ways. So all, all limited liability companies have to file annual returns every year, right? That's a legal requirement under the Companies Act. These, these businesses I've worked with, I've seen them file their annual returns 
And whereas last year, mommy owned 50%, daddy owned 50%. Next year, mommy is 25, daddy is 25, child A is 25, and child B is 25. And in the parents' heart of hearts, they believe they have legally transferred 25% of their shares each to their children because it's in the annual return, which is stamped with a company registry stamp and file. And they think, God, we're we doing the right things. We, we are on top of things. Our succession plan, check. Do you know that that does not legally validate transfer shares? Shares have to, you have to file, you have to do a share transfer form. It must be assessed at the BIR. There's stamp duty implications, and then it's filed at the company's registry. So even though you're not selling your shares, you are giving it to them, you still have to pay stamp duty based on the value of those shares. And those va that value would come from an independent valuation. So what does that mean? It means that it is costly to transfer shares to anyone, whether it's being gifted or sold. It is costly to do it during your lifetime because you have to pay the stamp duty on it. Now, if you're selling it, there's also the purchase price. So if you're selling the company, you're selling it for, for value plus more because you want to make a little profit, then you, you, there's a purchase price that has to be transferred, but then there's also the stamp duty. But even when you're giving it or donating it to your children or your loved ones for no consideration or value, you still have to pay stamp duty. And unless you do that, those shares are not legally transferred. And you may have done this annual return business, which I've seen quite a few clients do. And then you did your will and you never referenced these shares at all because you figured in your heart of hearts, you've already transferred it because you have this document stamped on the company's registry for your annual return. So that's another big area. Interesting. Interesting that you made those distinctions. Um, Daryl, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I was thinking, Avia, that there is an area that um, many of us wouldn't touch, but when the persons come to your office and, and you have the father figure being the speaker, the rest of the family members simply being listeners, but the father you're seeing, he's the one who's going down in age. How do we start those hard conversations with the leader figure in the family? with these SMEs, how do we start those conversations? Because that person, everyone in the family is listening and taking their cue from that person. That person may have started the business, that person may have been managing and making all the big decisions, but it is clear that the person is going on in age and some of the decisions may not be as sound as one would think would benefit the business for all concerned, how do we bridge that gap? How do we start those conversations? I know earlier in the week we spoke of how to encourage directors to be better directors. So even though in SMEs you may not have the person sitting as a director, they are the one who they're holding that business in their hands. They're holding the succession planning and that conversation there. So I think that's a gap that we need to look at. That's an excellent point, Doralan. I think what I totally endorse your sentiments. Go right ahead, Aliyah. I was just gonna say what, what I found quite surprising is that those same um, businessmen, they they will not take it a lot of the times so or they will not accept it when it comes from, from their children because these are the people that they took care of or as we like to say in the Caribbean, we um, clean your pampers, we change your pampers, we, we, we did whatever, whatever for you. So they, they still see them at this level um, and they therefore don't take the business advice. But yet when you bring in someone who is an external neutral third party, has the qualifications or the experience or the letters behind their name. I, I have found um, that, to, that, that to work. I mean, I've had sons say to me after meetings, but I don't understand what, what, what OB you just work in there. I tell any old man the same exact things. He's not taking it from me, but you come in there and, and he listened to you. And, and so, so it's not even a gender, a gender issue that's because you're female or male, but it's, sometimes they just can't hear it and I guess if we think of our own parents too, well, you know, sometimes they just don't want to take it from us. 
So it's important, you're right, to start the conversation. But it's totally. who is, you know, the messenger and the message. The, me the message gets received based on who the messenger is. I totally agree with you, Ali. I think that in cases like those, um, the persons at the helm of the of those companies would prefer to hear it from an expert, as you rightly said, they'll think this person is a child that I raised, and you know how could they be advising me? So these are, um, but but this is a difficult um, topic and a, and a difficult conversation to have. I, I must say, especially for businesses um, in the Caribbean and to some extent externally. So. I know this, the, the discourse this evening is, is very informative for me and I find it very, very interesting. And there may, those of you who may have questions um, that you may like to ask, or you may want to jump in and add a comment. Um, I'm going to ask Kamla, I'm unable to see the chat right now. If she, um, Feel free to raise your hand if you want to make a comment or you can put it in the chat and Kamla will be kind enough to to read your um, questions, but don't be shy. It would be great to hear from you. Cause this is quite an interesting discourse. This is a discussion that we don't usually have um, in families or even in businesses, but it's necessary and important. Uh, in fact, for me, I've found this discourse very, very enlightening. I think Doral unmuted herself because she wanted to add. Oh, uh, I was thinking of you, when you look at the history of small and medium enterprises and entities places which are no places like walmart for instance they started off as tiny family businesses and they have grown into massive billion dollar enterprises and they are not alone you have many in the international sphere that started off as small and medium enterprises so there is there is so much room for these SMEs to add value. And I suppose one of the takeaways we can take, we can, we can move with today is the fact, how can we bring them to the table to assist them in this growth? And I think we can. That, that's, that's, that's a great note to, you highlighted there. How do we bridge the gap to bring persons from where they are, they don't, this is a conversation they don't want to have, or they don't see it as necessary, but how do we bring, create that awareness? And that's where um, sessions like these come in, but how do we take it from this forum to those, those um, SMEs and family-owned businesses so to start that conversation? Um, Avia, if I may just um, come in for a little bit there, because that, that actually has been in my thought as well. Um, and I believe, you know, it's a pity that our members from the um, HUMAT, the Human Resource Association, um, our directors from there are not present here today, because clearly there's a need for us to understand that when we are dealing with family-owned businesses, it's not just the, the hard assets. It's not just the, the decisions with respect to strategy. And, and investments and all that, but looking after the well-being of the persons involved and making some very, very pertinent decisions along what Aliyah and, and Dorelan has shared with us. Because I, I shudder to think some family members building a business and then you have a, a key uh, person dies in that business and then you are discovering issues like children outside the marriage, cohabitation relationships that now gives them, you know, uh, some measure of value in there. Uh, those things can, the, we know they destroy relationships, but clearly they will destroy businesses as well. Absolutely, Kamala. I don't know if uh, Ali or Doral would like to respond or anyone who is in the room who'd like to share and, and, and if I may just add to, similar to the story that Doriland shared with the Da Costa uh, family, we were seeing it yes. in a much larger scale with the Rogers family out, out of Canada, a, a billion dollar business where there was no will when the father died, there was no succession plan either. And as a result, you had um, family members developing conflicts and 
it, it just led to all kinds of disclosures in court with father, um, f forgive me, the mother suing her son and, you know, um, really incredible things that we want to avoid, you know, and, and, and focus yes. on building and growing the family because then employees suffer as well. Yes, absolutely. It has a ripple effect. Situations like those will definitely have a ripple effect, not just on the family, but uh, other stakeholders, people who are connected to those um, family-owned businesses and SMEs. So this is quite um, an interesting conversation, but how do we translate this to the family business owners and the SMEs? That's, that's the question. Yes. Yes, I, I, there is another conversation which is extremely important, and it's a conversation about joint accounts. Now, I have found that many, like the elderly, once they are left alone, and let's say all their family, they are overseas, etc., they will go to the bank and they will sign a mandate where they are joint account holder to Tom, who is no blood. There are millions of dollars in this account. Now, the mandate is important. According to the mandate, maybe some of them are able to walk away with the money and others are not. But on many occasions, that joint account holder will walk away with millions of dollars. And you will have family members fighting and saying, but no, that was daddy's money, or that was mommy's money. But they weren't around and the, the, when the father or the parent was of sound mind, they attended upon the bank. They signed these mandates, these joint account mandates. And lo and behold, money goes, sometimes millions of dollars, to the joint account holder, who is not even a family member, who may just have been around giving, I will call it everyday support, in terms of checking the person out. You know, Darlan, that's so critical because this is Elder Abuse Month. And for the last couple of weeks, the Ministry of Social Development in Trinidad and Tobago, they have put on these free webinars for our elderly and, and anyone else attending. And that's exactly one of the points they were highlighting. The, the number of these accounts where these elderly has put their neighbor on, um, anyone who will come in to check on them because their children live overseas or, or abandon them. And then when they pass, pass on, what they've done is legally put that person as the remaining um, not named legal person on the, on the account. So who inherited that person? And, and so it is so important that people understand the implications of their actions. And that's why we're talking about how can we get that word out there, out, out there more. And I mean, I made the point that I think companies do play a role in just educating their staff, maybe the government, and because I mean, they are the largest employer in the country, but doing these sessions, and they don't have to be long sessions. They could be half an hour lunch and learns, little snippets. That, that's all people have time to process and remember, but they need to give it to them. And I just want to clarify one, not clarify, but I made the point about how expensive it is to transfer shares during your lifetime because you pay stamp duty. But I need to mention that on the flip side, when you leave those shares in your will, that transfer is actually free of charge. So that is also the reason why a lot of people, when they're doing their estate planning, they want to leave the shares in their business via their will because there's no duty to be paid on the value of those shares to legally transfer it after death. But as, as, we, as we all alluded to, that then goes back to, is that the best choice for leaving the shares? Because do those people you know, who inherit in it, are they the right ones to run it? So Christy, if you could just show my last slide, what I tried to put there is a, it's a quadrant equation, a box that sort of juxtaposes the cohesion that must be there between your succession, no, not that one, that one, cohesion between your estate plan and your succession plan. Because once you own, and I'm taking it in two segments, one is if you are the sole shareholder in the business and you want to leave it to your children, but your children have no interest or knowledge or desire to run it. This means, and but you still put it in your will and it is then passed to them by, by your will, then you've actually had no succession plan because you haven't sat down and discussed it with them. All you did was you left it for them in your will because you thought that was the right thing to do. You had an estate plan, but guess what? You had no succession plan. You needed to sit down and explore and discuss with them. And, and that probably would have resulted in the family agreeing to either sell the business, sell it outright, 
um, and therefore everyone gets their, their share during the, the founder's lifetime. Or it could have been you left back some of the shares and you, you sold and gave the rest of the shares to the people in the business who are running it. But you have to have the discussion. The second, so the second box is you still want to leave it to your family, but your family are interested in running the business. So then your succession plan is to bring them in early and all the things we spoke about earlier, to learn all the ropes of the business, to work in all the different departments and whatnot, so that your estate plan and your succession plan can in fact gel. They are cohesive when you would put them together like that. Now, when you are part owner in a business, so you own some of the shares, and you also then want to leave that in your will, things get even more problematic because that's going to happen when you passed on, your will has actually left these shares, your, your spouse or your, your children are not working in the business, but the remaining shareholders are there working blood, sweat, tears, toiling every day to earn money, but they collectively maybe own 60% of the business and the other 40%, which means the profits made with the other 40% have to be paid to your spouse and children because they are the shareholders now, but they're not involved in the business at all. That's going to lead to demoralization and, and, and cooking of the book so that they don't pay the full amount. So again, your estate plan and your succession plan were not cohesive in that regard because you didn't discuss. And it all goes back uh, to having this difficult conversation or difficult decision. What do you want to do with the business? Where do you want it to end up? Um, because the flip side to that would be you do something called a shareholder agreement, a memorandum of agreement. Um, it's called a buy-sell agreement in the U.S., where you actually have this documented in your um, between the shareholders, which is which states that when any of the shareholders die, the remaining shareholders agree on covenant to purchase his the deceased shareholder shares at the market value and and, and pay that value to their to the heirs or to the loved ones. So it's not that the your family who you've worked so hard for is going to be left out of pocket or left in the cold. They will get the value of the shares but they don't actually get the shares because having the shares has that responsibility to run the business. And that's again, where you've had a succession plan that's cohesive with your estate plan by having that type of document put in place. That was a brilliant um, comparison you shared about um, the importance of um, estate planning, and succession plan. In fact, they are they're intertwined. They go hand in glove. Because you you can have one without the other, but it will not serve the interests of the family owned business or an SME. So it's important to have both, not just to assign um, shares or just hand them out um, just because you, you feel like doing that. But it's important to when you when you are you hand over shares. To ensure that the persons uh, would have been exposed to the business. In fact, I read somewhere it says you prepare for the future now. So you don't wait until an eventuality and then you're reactive, which creates lots of problems. I, I guess lots of families may not survive um, that kind of a turmoil. And clearly, that can destabilize the business or even end up in closure or the business ending up in the wrong person's hands. So I think that. Um, it was pretty clear the, um, the importance of doing estate planning along with succession planning, most importantly to ensure that the persons in the family, that you have these, these discussions, even if it's around a dining table. So these are discussions that you should have throughout um, the life of the business to ensure that persons are aware and they understand what is happening and you don't to avoid um, the pitfalls of what can happen when you don't do, when you don't have an estate, and you don't have succession planning. Yeah, Avia, uh, you you mm -hmm. read my mind because I was about to ask uh, earlier. You know, at at what point do you start these conversations? So you have a, a lot of SMEs when when they get started, maybe they don't know how how big the the business will grow or also. But uh, so it doesn't cross their mind who exactly is is going to benefit or so. Uh, wh what do you advise? When should these discussions begin? I, mean, I don't think you can put an age or a number to it, um, but if you had to do a mixture of both, I would say once you reach your 50s, you should be looking at the next quadrant of your life. And do you really want to be working 
you know, in your 70s. So from, from your 50s, you can start identifying some of these basic things, laying down the roadmaps, identifying the successors, because you may not even realize by doing that at that stage, key employees who would add value to your business, if you have that conversation and rope them in from then, will end up staying in your business. Whereas you wait until you're 60, some other competitor has snapped them up and they've gone because in their mind, they didn't see themselves as part of the succession of your business. So don't wait until it's too long. There's, no, there's nothing stopping you from doing it. I just put 50 as half a century and people are, you know, attribute a lot of significance and sentimentality to the number. But I would also say when your business is, is large enough that you know you you are, you are making enough money to pay yourself a salary, pay your staff, contribute to society, do a little charity work. Then your business is at that point, is at a platform where it can in fact look to 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 operate without you. Because once once and in one of the earliest speakers said it, where you work nonstop and you're now starting up your business for the first couple of years, you're probably not even drawing a salary. You're just paying all your staff and running your basic expenses through the food. But once you get to that state where the business can run without you and you can go and chillax where, where Angela travel into Angela, you, go, you have some nice Back travel plans, <laughs> right? And you can do that and the business is still running. Angela, you're one that should look at succession plan too. You've built an empire for yourself, right? So you, you need to start looking at those things. Th then th that's the point. When your business can run successfully without you, succession planning is critical. Brilliant. Are there any um, comments from those of you in the room? Do you have any questions or comments or takeaways from so far from this discourse on estate planning and succession planning? We'd yes, love to hear from you. Um, yeah, Christine has unmuted. So Christine, did you have a, a question that you wanted to ask? I just had a comment. You know, I've really enjoyed this session, right? Uh, I don't normally talk in these sessions. I see no camera, I'm very shy. <laughs> but I mean, I want to say how important this topic is because I can act talk from the panel talking. I can actually draw on two uh, scenarios that I already have at, in existence where a, hus a family business, a husband has died prematurely. The children are in the business. You know, they continue the business for so many years after his death, you know, but they continued it because of the relationship they had with their customers, with their employees, you know, all these different things. And now they're in a position now after COVID, of course, where they, they can't do it anymore, right? And now they, they, they feel the need that they need to close up and that kind of thing, right? That's just to say, you know, the father did not put anything in place, really. You know, they had a new building, the, uh, it was mortgaged, the bank made the family or had the family paying 12 to 18 months of mortgage, which was covered by insurance, but they didn't know, right? So a lot of things, a lot of information isn't passed along, you know, due to the untimely deaths of individuals, right? And then there's another scenario where a father who knows he's going down in age, this one is a very big company, group actually, and he knows he's going down in age, so he's literally passing it on, on to his eldest son, right? So, I mean, there is so much difference between those that plan and those that don't plan. That's all I wanted to say, but thank you so much. Christine, I'm happy that you weren't shy and you decided to add a significant contribution to this discourse. Thank you so much for those two stories that you shared. I see Laurel unmuted herself. Yeah, Avi, I keep thinking of the Starbucks kind of model. And Starbucks, they, would, they had given the employees a small stake when they joined. Um, and and that's, that, that helped continuity of the business. Now, if we can't trust our own children, how do we extend that to our employees? So there must be a way of, of, of getting a buy-in by employees. 
such as the Starbucks model, to let them know that we value them, to let them know that we cherish them, and they are making a significant contribution. I totally agree with you. I've spent uh, more than two decades in, in a family-owned business. Actually, it was a sole trader. Um, it is a sole trader business. But what we found is that persons who joined the company uh, stayed with the company. I've, like, I've been there for like over two decades. So it's more of less, like you feel as part of like a family, more or less. So it's, it's a place that you want, want to stay. And I think if we were to look at the, the cost detail that you shared earlier, clearly there was a, a gap. There was um, no relatives or family members were not a part of the business integrally or even members of the team. So a business that could have, um, whether the storm in COVID lost that opportunity because um, clearly they didn't have um, a succession plan there. Or even the Starbucks model um, implemented. But this is a discourse that we definitely need to have more of um, Kamla in the Caribbean because this, I was gonna ask if there's any statistics regarding um, this topic that will give us an idea of where we are as a region, as it relates to estate planning and succession planning, it will be interesting. You know, Avia, I think that is a really interesting point you made too, which is in family businesses, the turnover isn't very high. Whereas, you know, you look at the, the private sector, the big banks, insurance companies, every Monday morning, new staff, somebody changes. The turnover of staff is much higher in those types of businesses than in the family business. And the, the, value that the family business brings to our society. I mean, it's been on Discord so many times in today's um, sessions, but it's because they run a different way, right? They, they place an emphasis on the long-term survival of the business because it's, it's their baby, it's their creation, and they want to leave it for future generations. So as opposed to the banks and insurance companies where the focus is on short-term profits and appraisals and getting meeting target, 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 family businesses are run a little bit differently as well. Family businesses don't borrow as much from the banks um, be because they try to sell fund so that when economic cycles and inevitable downturns do occur, a lot of family businesses are able to survive. I mean, this is COVID notwithstanding, right? This is just general principles. So the family business is a such a critical and crucial part of the DNA of the business community um, for, for all those reasons. The turnover, the turnover is very low because people feel that they're part of the family. So you have something there that's working like clockwork. You have staff that want to continue staying there. I mean, I, I recently joined the LJ Williams board and I had my first board meeting on the compound last week. And I met employees there, been there for 38 years. Um, a lot of them were in their 30s. That's a family run business where the employees are there as long as the family members because they feel loyal to the company. And, and you would have seen in the news just last night where they were talking about the significant increase in profits the Elgin Williams group um, ran. But well, not to segue, it's just the different way in which a family business runs for all those reasons where we just itemized. I think because they're so important and they, they're, they're so such a crucial part of the DNA of, of the business and the economy, they have to look at succession planning and estate planning because to not do that would be doing an injustice to what they've built and what their forefathers have, have built because of how crucial they are in providing employment and, and revenue to, to the unexport and earning God knows foreign exchange that we badly need. So they, they all do need to really sit down and place some emphasis on this crucial topic. So Kamala, we are charging you with getting that word out there. But I, I, Ali, I wanted to ask you to just um, uh, uh, align in with that. So what happens when it's partnerships? Because sometimes it may not be family members. It may be friends get together and, and start a business together. What happens then if one of them dies? So that's why, again, you, you have to have these side agreements. You have to have the shareholder agreement, or what's called the buy-sell agreement in, in the U.S. You, you can't just take the carbon copy, what's in the Companies Act. I mean, what's in the Companies Act basically allows you to leave your shares to your next of kin. So you can, if, if you have shares in a partnership and you, um, you know, well, a partnership is different because that's a different legal structure from, from a, a limited liability company. But with a partnership, once you die, I mean, there, there's nothing you can leave 
um, because that is a it's more of a loose business arrangement. You, you may have some more well-established partnerships where there is equity, there's an equity stake, but that's really only for the larger, larger ones like the actuarial firms and the law firms. They have set up legal partnerships, but you and your friend throwing parties or doing interior decoration or doing business, you all don't really have a legal structure around that, but you have a bank account in the name of that, that business and you pass on without any side agreement then it, it's your, your heirs have nothing, no legal claim. Now, hopefully there's some moral sway and some goodwill that your business partner will give half the proceeds to, to your next of kin because she's like a friend to the family, but, but you can't hold her to that. There's nothing to sue on. And it, you know, the rule of thumb that I always operate by, if everything breaks down, relationships break down, and we have to take it to court, what leg do you have to stand on? What legal documentation? So you have to show your stake in that and with a loose partnership like that, which is what most businesses really start up as. So I guess this call out is also to the startups, make sure once you, you know, you're under your feet, I think one of the earlier ladies was saying for her first three years, all she did was work, 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 work. So her strap plan just fell on her desk and was never opened. But you need to take the time to do those things as well and to crystallize the legality of the, the arrangement because you know, you are not the only person and it's not your business alone. Avia, there's a question on the chat from Sanyo. Question, is there anywhere in the region with living will, living will type provisions? And is this something we should be promoting in place of, as well as present planning options? I can't remember what a living will is. I'll take that and Doran can jump in. So a living will is really a directive to a physician that lets people state their wishes for end of life medical care in case they become unable to communicate their decisions later on. So it usually takes the form of a document which, in which you can record your decisions as to the circumstances and types of medical treatment that you wish to refuse in the event you don't have the capacity to communicate that decision um, later on. I'll be very honest, I spoke to the head of the Medical Association in Trinidad and Tobago, and they said it's not really something that they I don't want to say, oh, no. um, but in Trinidad, I say there's very little precedence locally. First of all, people using it, but even for those that have prepared it, the, the president of MPAC was basically as the Medical Professionals Association of Trinidad and Tobago. She said there's little precedence of doctors locally adhering to them, mostly because the physicians then put themselves at risk of litigation if they don't do everything in their power to save the patient's life. So it's a real possible, I mean, a really interesting question, Sandy. Thanks for bringing that, bringing that up. Um, that, was, that, that, that was an interesting question indeed. So I am going to ask, uh, if there are no other questions in the chat, or anyone with a comment, I'm gonna ask for you to share your closing remarks. So we'll go back to Doral. Purposeful organizations develop the next generation, not simply the next leader. Purposeful organizations develop the next generation, not simply the next leader. I will leave that there. That was a brilliant quote. <laughs> I'm definitely going to um, add that to my archive. Aliyah, closing your closing remarks. Mine might be a bit cliche, but it is literally, if you fail to plan, plan to fail. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So you were doing some bottom lining this afternoon <laughs> uh, in terms of your closing remarks. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you both for being great panelists. I actually felt like I got to know you even before I saw you on camera because of the exchanges we had via email. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Kamala for always putting together the best thought leaders <laughs> and expert industry experts ever. And for keeping us glued to our Zoom because we can't get enough of the discourse. Uh, we would definitely like for you to have um, Kamala, you were given a charge as part of the Caribbean Corporate Governance in Institute to ensure that these this, we advance these discussions. Um, clearly, it's an area that is not um, very much verbalized. So this is something that um, an area that you can take advantage of 
and more or less get this out in the public domain. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you both for sharing. Thank you for the learnings you would have imparted to us. And thank you, Kamla. And I return control back to master control. Thank you, Kamla.